Today on Core Conversations, we have Rad Dockery. Rad has been preaching diversity in the marketplace since 2007. Being in the tech field, he sees the lack of black representation in corporate America. We discussed today the importance of data and explained why black wealth matters in layman's terms. The best example we can give to this next generation is to set examples now, get wins now, and lead by example. Enjoy the conversation. I'm Rad Dockery. I'm resident of Mississauga for 30 plus years now. Um, born and raised here. I'm a chief innovation officer at Unify Solutions. Um, we're a tech company focused on data and focused on using tech to drive business and financial results as well as social results. I'm one of the co-founders of the company. We've been in business for about three years now. Um, I also also run another um, consulting firm focused on um, diversity and also focused on tech as well. So most of my life's in tech and that's what I do for a living. Um, I'm a technologist um, who focus on bringing tech, business and social and put it all together to make a difference. Yes, very cool. And I don't know, and over the years, I was saying in some of the intros that um, you've been doing this for a long time and it's trendy now. And I, you know, I can just imagine how much pushback you had when you realized that this was a need long before people recognized there's a need for it. Oh, pushbacks an understatement, man. <laughs> yeah. um, you, you, you got a lot of head nodding. Oh, that sounds great, but, well, that sounds great, but, or you do one or two things and it seems to work, but no yeah. one to take it to the next step. Yeah. Uh, so I think, I think clearly I'm not saying I'm any smarter than anyone, but because of, because of how my brain works, I look for trends. Okay. And I look for things that are about to happen. I see what's happening in front of me. I can project the future. And yeah, there's a lot of heavy, nasty pushback. Um, mm-hmm. Very nasty, actually. Really? Or people who said diversity was nice, but when you actually try to deal with it, some severe actions were taken against some of us who stood up or some wow. of us who tried to call out issues. And my people lost jobs. People had to go find new jobs. People had to know look at new career options people went to mental breakdowns people had breakups at home with family so you no know, they see this happening now is heartening but a lot of damage has already been done yeah um, a lot of damage has already been done it's coming kind of out of those things where you know you know if you've been beating me up for 10 nine rounds and you say in the 10th round i got a couple of licks in i still lost the match yes right <laughs> right yeah no it's true yeah right Before we, so, I, 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 I want to hear like some of your, your stories of like, like what you just said there, but before we get into it, just to paint a picture for those who are watching, what would you do in your diversity training? Like what actually would you be presenting to a corporation as this is what we want to bring to you guys? Well, the first thing is to have data. Okay. Uh, the, the, this discussion about your hearing right now, since you no, know, may rest in peace, what happened to George Floyd and Brianna Taylor, et cetera. And what's happening up here, of course, I'm with the Fonte mm-hmm. member. Um, the first thing you want to have is data. Number one, um, I'm not into making moral arguments with immoral people. I'm, I don't yeah. have time for that, right? So this, yeah. this nice, warm, and fluffy, we should all just be one. I get it. Some people like it. But those in power, right now I'm looking at the business news now. I'm seeing the stock prices roll. That's the bottom line, right? Yes. Um, so you have, you have to make these things based off of data. Yes. Number one. What data do you have to back up that something's an issue? And then what impact does that data have? Uh, okay. so, if you're not, so, so if you're not properly engaged in particular communities, mm-hmm. so what impact would that have on the bottom line? You have to draw a parallel. If you don't draw that parallel, it's a waste of time. Mm-hmm. And even when you do draw it, sometimes you're not listened to, but you have data. And I think back then when I first started, the concept of data was different. Right. Because we weren't, I mean, 10 years ago when I was doing this 11 years ago, no, the internet was there, but no, there was no Facebook. Facebook wasn't big yet. No social media wasn't big yet. And no, did we know what they were doing with our data back then. Now we know now because of data and data is the new oil. Data is the most precious commodity in the world right now. Now we know that data is king and queen. So I think the key thing is, you know, what kind of data do you need to gather and then from those data points, what can we then do to fill the gap? That's the approach I take. Yeah, so I, I think that the, the data point is so critical. And I can't emphasize it because, you know, businesses make decisions based on what 
information they have. Yes. A lot of your information is stuck in data. Mm-hmm. And there's data and there's information. And I, it's an analogy that I've used many years and I'll use it now. You know, if I say, you know, I want to find out, you know, what is the, you know, I want a comparison of a BMW M3 to a, a, a AMG C65 on Mercedes. No, yeah. I want the latest reports on it. If I do a Google search on that, I get millions of hits. That's data. Okay. Information is what is the information I could get out of that and actually help me make a purchasing decision or which car I'd like to rent for a weekend. That's information. And that line between data and information is the big problem now. So okay. you see it in politics. You know, you do a search on coronavirus, you hear a million things about what you could do about it. But yeah. how much of that is actual real information versus someone's just opinion of what they think you should do to prevent prevent from getting some COVID nineteen? So yeah. we're in this we're in this data versus information in between. There, people are spinning what they want to spin. Right. So it's right. so critical that we have a critical mind. We're we're looking at this. Yes, there are emotional aspects, but you do with businesses, man. Businesses are about that stock price. Yes, they're about that share price. They're about revenue and profit growth, mm-hmm. right? And they do a lot of nice things. And some companies are actually authentic some of the things they do. I'm not saying that. But the bottom line is they can't say, well, I'm doing a lot for diversity. We missed our we missed our revenue numbers for three quarters in a row. Shareholders ain't going to take lightly to that. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So now and you got gathered- pension. And by the way, that's your pension. That's your retirement depending on that as well, right? Right. So- right. Yeah. So people care about that most. So, so your first step is data. Data number one. Yes. Um, no, but but what data you want, you, you need someone, this is where diversity matters. You need people who could discern what kind of data you should be looking at. So a lot of big corporations will say, well, look at this. We, we did a survey and no, 87% of our people of color who work here are happy here. And they throw that around and put it on their website, have a yeah. picture of a black person running around, no smiling at office and <laughs> yeah, everything's great, yeah. right? And even before the data, we all knew us black folk people. Like, come on, man. Come on. Yeah, exactly. Like, come on, like, come on man. We know that company. We know in that job, you hate it. You're just doing it because it pays the bills. Right. right? Or we yeah. know your name. We know you're never going to be promoted out of that call center job. Right. Right. Yes. Right. Or you know you've been in that same job for 12 years and watch people you train become managers above you. Yes. Right. So, so that's a thing that, you know, you look at the whole idea of who's discerning the data and what questions you're asking. What are you actually looking for? You're looking for, are you looking to validate what you really want people to believe? Mm-hmm. You're going to look at data and ask questions that you haven't really thought about. So there's actually there was a survey that's done by Harvard Business Review. They, they warned companies about this. They said, if you notice that you only have, for instance, two and a half percent of your work population are black women, right? But overall, your visible minority poll said that 72% of people are happy who are people of color. But if you actually look at the black black woman and really look down, are black women really happy? Mm-hmm. And right. It's only two and a half percent, but that's still their experience. When you just bum them into everyone else, then black women are ignored. They're, yeah, exactly. And, you, and if you they're dig lost, deeper, you yeah. may find that you may find that half of those black women have advanced degrees and advanced experience, and they're stuck in jobs supporting people that are more qualified for. But you, you do, but you don't want to look for the data. You just want right. to look for things that validate what you believe is to be correct. Right. And that's why data discernment, who's asking the questions. And this is why the whole discussion about artificial intelligence is a very important one, because if the people who are looking at the data are biased, AI will just double your bias. Uh, will just double your ignorance. Yes. But artificial intelligence like a human. If you only learn one thing growing up a particular way, you're going to keep doing it. But you have a different voice now saying, well, what about this? So data is important, but the people and the kind of mindsets of people who are looking for data, the discover data, that's the most critical thing. So how do you change that? How do you break that cycle? <sighs> when I figure that out, I'll be a billionaire. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Because I mean, be I a, heard that. that makes, like, and you just explained that beautifully for someone, someone like me who just likes to move or wants to just get people like you know, exercising. There may be some other who that like in the simplest forms, you just made that make so much sense. And that's the, so what? So now what? Yeah. Yeah. So, so I think, I mean, this is sales one-on-one. It comes down to you're, you're making a sales pitch, right? Yes. As to why this should matter. Right. Well, 
So I think one of the key things is so what doing this when I talk about link in the face, I'm talking about corporations now, I'm not talking about general society. I'm talking okay. about a company, a Fortune 500 company, Fortune 100 company, you no, know, who's on blacked out Tuesday, all of them had a blackout sign on their IG page, right? Right. You no, know, all good and fine. I know they made statements on LinkedIn. We support these black causes, right? And they gave money to charities, and that's all good and fine. But their board of directors, white. Their executive team's white. And I'm saying, okay, if they're all white, that's fine. But you can't tell me you couldn't find anyone of color who's qualified. We're not asking just give us something. We're asking for a shot. That's what we're asking for. Yes. We're asking for a fair shot. That's all we're yes. saying. So if I don't get it, I can live with it. But it can't be every time I don't get it. It can't be every time we're overlooked or every time we're missing something. So the so what, you have to link it to a business result. So let me okay. give you an example. I was talking to a large grocery store chain that will name nameless now. Um, I was talking to a grocery store chain. Also, I'm, a, I'm a technologist, so we're talking about a technology piece that has to be work and all that stuff. Yeah. And halfway through the call, this is, the, this is at the height of the protest, right? So I'm here and I'm looking at my TV. I'm, I'm on a call, Zoom call like this. I'm looking at my TV like this. And you know, you know, you want to say something, but you're on a business call. And you're like, man, <laughs> you're pissing your teeth. You're like, sick and tired of this crap. <laughs> no, yeah. so so the guy he he said something it just triggered me. I kind of lost it a little bit. Yeah, and I just said to him, you know what I realized? No, around Carabana time, you guys used to have Aki available for like five ninety nine at all of your stores across the GTA. Yes, and I go. I don't know if you've been to Jamaica, but Aki is our national fruit. People of Caribbean descent really love it, but it's so expensive. But Carabana time, you guys always used to have it on sale at various stores. And I'd go on Facebook or LinkedIn or whatever and say, hey, everyone, go to this store, go buy your five tins, right? And yes. we all would go buy five tins. I go, the last five years, you guys don't do that anymore. Why? Hmm. And he said, well, what do you mean? I go, well, you're a grocery store chain. If I go to a grocery store to buy one thing, what's mostly going to happen? I'm going to buy more than one more thing. thing. Yes. I'm going to say, oh, or I might, you know, you're going to text your spouse or someone in your family. Say, oh, you know what? I might as well pick up these other, before you know it, you start spending 35 bucks, you spend $95. Yes. Right. Or you, or you may like the fact that this store has a particular product that you never get to see anymore. So you may start going to that store again. So I did a quick, quick calculation. I said, I have what? 2,000 Facebook friends, let's say 300 of them agreed, and they bought this and the average spent this amount of money off of me alone that generated $1.7 million, and I'm one guy. So, oh, so, so, so my other friends now who have more, more Facebook friends than I have, when they did the same thing, you're looking at potentially 70, 80, 100, $130 million for the stores in the GTA of sales. Now, you tell me, if I told your CFO that because your systems aren't modern, it costs you $130 million of sales, would you have a job tomorrow? Yes or no? Yikes. And your silence on the phone. Yeah. And I said to him, and I said to my go, but this is what we're talking about. Because you have nobody who understands lens from a, business from a cultural lens. You think, you think it's just people marching down the street? You think it's just Black Lives Matter? Black wealth matters, and actually your wealth matters. If I told this, if I told your board of directors 130 to 200 million dollars could be made in one weekend by simply adjusting your supply chain, but you need people of diverse voices, diverse experience, you need people who look like me and you on to get involved, or the black woman who you who you've been ignoring in analytics have been telling you this for eight years, but you don't listen to her. Right. And the fact that all you on this phone are white people who are qualified, you're brilliant, but you're missing a blind spot, a 200 million dollar blind spot. Ouch. Right? So that's the so what. Now, the problem with systemic racism in corporate and business, and I'm going to be very honest here, in the U.S., if you make that statement, the biggest redneck, the most racist person might say, hmm, I don't like that Martin boy, but that's $200 million. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's, right? Yeah. Right? Agreed. That guy's a certain part of that guy in a certain part of Europe you're wondering about who you know, posts some weird stuff, we tell him $200 million. He's like, $200 million? Mon Dieu. Let's go do something. Mm -hmm. Right? Sometimes in Canada, though, when you make that statement, that still doesn't get to a Canadian executive's head. Because it can't phantom that it comes from somebody who looks like me and you. Yes. Right? So, so the so what is that? You have to come with that kind of impact. Yes. Right. Because if you do, can you come with the other impact? Yeah, great. Some of these institutions have given $1.5 million to help out certain not for profits, and that's all good. I love it. 
And that's fantastic because they need the money. But what impact does that have for when you no know, your sons grow up and try to get that job or have that big income gap? Right. Right. And this is real stuff. I mean, you no know, talking about races before I, from a economic point of view. The stats are clear. Stats can has the data right here in Canada. So someone like me and you, born in Canada, mm-hmm. and our parents come from Jamaica. So we're first generation Canadian. The stats have shown that university educated black men who have this, who have a degree, much of the same schools as our white counterparts coming out of school will make anywhere between 17 to 30% less in their first job. In Canada. In Canada. So if you're making 50 K a year equality, right? You're making 38 compared to your white counterpart. Now add that up over five years. That's 60 K. Right. Yeah. And then you add in inflation or interest that you can make off on an investment, whether it be an RSP or TFSA or appreciation in real estate, that gap is huge. Mm-hmm. Right? And that's right here in Canada. And there's more and more studies coming out like that. So the so it's fine to sit there and say, make all these nice little statements, but let's be real about it, man. If you can't pay those bills of euro behind twelve, thirteen, fifteen thousand dollars when yeah. you start from day one out of school, ten years later, that adds up. It adds up. Right. And what and for what? Because you're black? Because of what? Because of what? Right? So yeah. and so the data point would then be the question then we'd ask would say, is there something within the education system that's wrong? Or does some that we're or are we not taking the right courses? And if we're not, why aren't we taking the right courses? Why are we afraid of them? Or if we do take the right courses, why aren't we succeeding? See, these are kind of questions from a data point of view you have to ask. Yes. Versus Versus we're, we're top 10 on some list that's made up by some people to justify their existence. Right. And they're just, and they're just asking the right questions to pad their bias. Of course. Right. I mean, to a, as humans, we all do that sometime in certain things, yeah. but we're talking about like, man, I mean, we're talking about billions of dollars transferring all over the place. And we're sitting down here watching people who we trained in better positions than we are. And I'm not saying it's happened to everybody. I'm not saying that it's happened to people of all the races. I'm not saying that, but I'm not here to speak for that. I can only speak to my experience, right? Yeah, and yeah, experience exactly. of many others, right? right? And it can't be every time I, I mean, I've been in tech since 1980, 1998, before yeah. TELUS, when TELUS used to be clarinet. So I started yeah. working in tech. And I can maybe count eight times in those 20 plus years was another black man or woman in the room with me at a decision-making table. Yes. I yeah. could count. I still, I, could, I probably know all of them by name and I'm still friends with them on LinkedIn. And a lot of them have lost their jobs or got demoted. Right. Wow. So right. these are real impacts. And what impact does that have when you have to kind of come home and you know, face your spouse and say, wow, I was a VP. Now I'm down to this, or I was doing this and now I'm down to that. Right. Yes. So, yes. The, so the so what, the so what's not easy, but a so what has to be impactful. Yes. Impact the bottom line. You could use a social lens, but you have to hit the bottom line straight up. Yes. Wow. Crazy. So then now as you do more diversity training and actually, let me ask you like this. I've had some conversations with uh, men and a lot of times the, ang- the, the angle that we want to take is, it's, <sighs> I don't want to just like give up on this generation, but then let's, let's talk about our children. How do we, how do we educate those still in school? How even younger, how do we empower them and give them knowledge and stuff so that they don't have to go through the same thing that we do? Yeah. So I think definitely all those who have kids or nephews or nieces or God children, we worry about this. Um, Let me always take the question and alter it a little bit. I like what you said in the beginning. Let's not give up on this generation. You know, I just, you know me for a long time, right? People yeah. who don't know, know, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, but yeah. Um, I've mentored a lot of young people, right? I've been fortunate, blessed enough to mentor a lot who've also taught me a lot. And I think half, over half of my social media friends are young people I've mentored or <laughs> seen me speak yeah. in an event. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm blessed for that and they've taught me more than they I probably taught them. Uh, yes, you know about the future, but the best way to impact the future is the impact now. I mean, I mean, you, you're a personal trainer. You've been doing training forever. It's like, well, it's getting started today. Yes. And then at six months from now, if you do the right thing, you'll see results, right? Right. Yeah. It can't be well. Oh, it can't be well. One year you'll be okay, but you've not do. You're not doing something today. 
No, today you're going to eat more fruit. Today you're going to do a bit more exercise. You take a baby step, right? Today yes. you're going to start. Yes. And, if we, and if, if we just keep, keep and try to measure progress and be positive, at some point you're going to start seeing goals. You're going to start yes. seeing results, right? Yes. So I think the first part of that is the question, I get it, but the best ways for, the best ways for the, our young people to see us succeed, period. We're in a show me generation. That's why in IG, you see 5,000 pages of people showing off, right? You see people, you see young men posing with cars that are not really theirs, right? You see some young women trying to be the next, you no know, best top model on IG, right? So you see this, people are flossing, right? Yeah. Or trying yes. to front like, you no, know, they're living on top, right? Yes. Um, so it's fine. So that I get that. But the best indicator of success is for children to see those older people around them succeed. You yes. can tell them what you want to tell them. So right. for instance, you know, you're a trainer, right? You're in great shape. With respect to some other trainers who are saying like, you could do to get in shape. If you in shape too, not in shape too, I'm going to be like, but wait, yeah. you're talking about getting in shape, yo, and watch, you can't even walk up a flight of stairs. Right. Well, you, yes. Now you may have knowledge yep. of doing so, right? But it means a lot more when I see it's you. It's like getting advice on wealth management from someone who's broke. Yeah. Right? Where I watched that thing on Warren Buffett yesterday, I learned 50 things that school didn't teach me about Warren uh, Buffett. Yeah. You know what I mean? Who am I going right. to listen to? Warren Buffett who's worth a trillion dollars? Or the dude on the street may have some knowledge and wisdom I'm going to taste a nugget. So yeah. what are kids, one of the things I think that I'm concerned about is that we're, every generation we're told, wait for the next one. Wait for the next one. Help right. the next one. Help yeah. the next one. Help the next one. You got to help it now. We need results, right? So when I talk to some okay. of these young people, you know, so I've mentored a lot of these young people I've mentored and they've asked for help and I haven't been able to deliver because I don't got it. You see yeah. what I'm saying? That's yeah. real, yeah. right? So I think the first, you want to empower the kids, empower the parents. Yes, that's what Miguel Number Silva's one. just saying there too, yeah. Right? Now, yeah. we got to see it first. And I think it's a bit different for us from the Caribbean, right? And those came, or came here from Caribbean or West Africa in the 60s and 70s when our parents did. Because they came here to work. Yes. Right? They came right. here. I don't even know what this anti-black racism was because they, when they grew up, everyone was black. Right? Yeah. And, right. And, and they believed that when we got educated, that we will get a good job and it will be okay. And it's not till someone was hit, hit about in our forties that our parents are realizing, hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah. My kids done everything right and they're stuck. Yes. Right. 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 So, so our kids, yeah, it's our future generation, but they have to see success because if you just talk about it, you're not being mm-hmm. about it. Right. Just, it doesn't mean you, you drive the biggest car, you have the biggest house, but they got to see like, yo, mommy, daddy, auntie, godfather, godmother, or even someone who I know down the street, you know yeah. what? They're getting it done. Right. Right? Yeah. But, but, when, but when they're not dumb, these kids are smarter than we are today. The 12, 13, 14, 15 years, they're smarter than we are. They yeah. can go online. They could go to a company's board of directors and say, oh, how come everyone's white? They could go and see the, the top 100 startups in Canada see none of them are run by black people. Right. They're not stupid. So yeah. we could talk all we want. So I think the first step is we need to show success now, now, like right now, because it's you versus that IG blogger. It's you versus that person who's flossing online, yes. right? It's you yes. versus the wannabe hip hop artist. It's you versus the person who believes it's going to be an MBA no matter what. <laughs> it's you versus that. And the yes. reality is when they turn on the TV and they don't see me or you, they don't see the black woman on TV. They don't see that. We could talk all we want. Yes. You know what I'm saying? And yeah, yeah. Th- and this, this is why the whole idea of case studies matter, right? Okay. So it's about the best way. When I when I sell technology or I invoke technology solutions, I use case studies. I don't talk about the bits and bytes. I talk about what's the impact of something. Okay. Right? So what are the best impacts for our young people to show success? Now, if we don't have it yet, tell them, here's the things I've been learning. Here are yes. different people I'm seeing out there. But I'm in the process. <laughs> so they can see the process right. and they can see the small victories as you go along. And be honest with your frustrations, depending on the age of the child. Be mm-hmm. honest about the frustration. Be yeah. honest about that. You no, know, me and one of my guys I just saw logged on here. Um, you no, know, we talked about you no know, one of the banks, I won't say the name, one of the bank's chairman of the bank has no banking experience. What? Zero. Right now, he's a smart dude. Don't get me wrong; the dude's brilliant. God, I've worked from him in a past life. Right, the dude's absolutely genius. But you imagine 
you go apply for a job and you have no experience in something? Yeah. You can imagine what would happen to you? Yeah. I mean, you, for, first of all, even if, if someone got you the interview and they said, we want you to run this, run to be the chairman of our bank. Yeah. And homeboy said that you said the homeboy, I don't have no banking experience, yo. They'd be like, well, what are you doing here? Exactly. But, yeah. but no, the white privilege kicks in that homeboy's chairman of a bank. Not, not, no, not an advisor, not a, a consultant. He's the chairman of the board. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, you, you are the most powerful mofo in the joint. Yes. Straight up. But, yeah. But, but you know, like J.B. Kennedy's laughing, she knows we talk about this all the time. And here is a black person, and you can have 50 PhDs in mathematics and finance, the, yeah. you'll get some lame excuse, right? right? Our yeah. kids are not dumb. They could do Google better than you and I can. But again, see with them then, they have too much data. We need to be not able to do information. Big, we got to convert that data to information for them. Yes. That's the best we could do for our young people. All yeah. the stuff you see, Make, how to make a take out of the noise and say, here's what it is as a young black person. Yeah. That's the key. Yeah. Long winded answer. Sorry, but I wanted to no, talk, no, no, about, that's a great wanted to talk about the parent thing, but yes. how to draw that out and create information that's yes. useful. That's our primary job. I think as, as adults, whether it's your kids or kids that you're mentoring, et cetera. Yes. Yes. That, you know, that's, that reminds me yesterday we were watching the Ruby bridges and uh, this is small. It's like a made-for-TV movie that was on Disney Plus. Like someone put it on their Instagram. So I sure I just went onto onto TV and I found mm -hmm. it. So I watched the movie with the boys yesterday. And as I was watching, I I wanted to just highlight for them one thing that really didn't seem like it was relevant to the movie itself. Uh, Ruby Bridges, for those who don't know, is a six-year-old girl who was the first student to go to uh, uh, one of the schools, segregated schools that was now yeah. forced to be integrated. U U.S. Marshals had to bring her into the school every day because there's so much pushback and stuff. So it's a fascinating story. And the, the mother was really pushing for the daughter's education because she was absolutely brilliant. And the father was a little bit resistant because he's had his own struggles being in the war, you know, fighting for a country that's not fighting for him. And, and that's the side story, side plot to the story. I was highlighting for my sons the fact that in this Louisiana uh, community that where they lived, that the father was a mechanic, a trained mechanic. His neighbor owned a tavern. And this is like almost like middle class black community. And I mm -hmm. noticed like, you know, while the kids were watching this, did you notice that every black man in this was educated? That every black man in this movie had a job, was holding down a job, owns a tavern, all these different things. I wanted to point that out. That it wasn't just a typical, you know, mom has a job and then dad's trying to find a job and trying to make his way. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. like there, there was examples of black men who, who own their homes, who are renting their homes, who had like, who are doing these things. So I wanted to point that out that even back in the 50s and 60s, that there were men that were holding it down with the education, providing for the homes and, and setting examples as dads. Yeah, no, that's an excellent point. It's a like fantastic example. Um, and you know Canada right here in Halifax with Africville, yes, right, a vibrant yeah. community that was pumping along, and they bulldozed the thing down for yeah. what? Why? Right? You know, you're right. in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where the President of the United States just spoke on Juneteenth. He almost spoke on it of all dates. You no know, yeah. Black Wall Street, right? Right? Yeah. So, so we've had these things in place for a while, and. No, that's part of the history we have to teach our young people. Well, first of all, we gotta know it first. We gotta right? know it first. Yeah, great. And so what? So what you did there? So profound. What you just did? No, mm -hmm. look, we we've always been educated. This is the norm. Yes. No, when did education when did education become not normal? When did it become not normal to live a good life? Right. Exactly. Right. Yeah. right? And so yeah. these are the kind of things that. No, when did it change? How did it change? And that, I'll let the people who are sociologists and break that down. As yeah. hip hop heads, we know when they took when they changed hip hop, it changed a lot of things. As people who are old school hip hop heads, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, but we had a, we had shows like a different world that made college university normal and cool. Yeah. Right. So right. I want to go because not only is it good for my brain, it's good for me, right? Yeah. But the, to that extent, now though, but even today though. No, what you see now, we have some black people who are educated up the yin yang, man. Mm -hmm. I meet MBAs, PhDs, certifications I've heard of in my life, and they're stuck. Yes. 
right? So it's almost like they, so it's like a football analogy where you keep moving the goalpost. I kick a forty yard field goal, you go, you go, oh no, 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 make it fifty. Oh no, 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 make it sixty. And when I, and when I make it seventy and I miss a seventy yard field goal, you get mad at me. But you move the ball back thirty yards on me, man. <laughs> what do you want me to do? <laughs> you know what right. I'm saying? My foot ain't yeah. that strong. You know what I'm saying? Right. So, exactly. Right. Right. So I think so. Even that, though, our parents you know said go to school, get education. Then corporate told us go get this degree, go get that certification, go get this, go get this, go get that, go get that. They look at your white counterparts; they don't have half of what you got, and they're and they're like your vice president. Yes. Right. And, right. I, and that's for everybody. I'm not saying it's just, it, I'm no. not saying it's just us black people dealing with that, but for right. us, it's profound because the numbers we talked about in the beginning, there are yes. serious money gaps, income gaps that we have. Yes. And those income gaps have real, have real negative impact. Mm-hmm. That's straight up. Yes. Right. We live in a capitalist society. Right. right. And you need dollars. I mean, it's all nice to say y'all you have great morals and you should have them. But at the end of the day, when that bill is due on the 15th of every month, they don't care. They want their money. Yes. Straight. So then, uh, yeah. So that just makes me think then um, home ownership, having some equity, those kind of things. How does that tie into this whole equation, what we're talking about? Well, you know, that's interesting because maybe more in the U.S. than Canada, this was pushed for home ownership, but then we saw the 2007, 2008 crisis with the, yes. the funny money. Right. And those people who really don't understand what that crisis meant, you know, there's a lot of good, you know, the big short, there's a really good movie about it. It's okay. They had some humor in it. Watch yes. that stuff because black people were impacted negatively from that. In okay. Canada, we don't have much data, but we know about the eye tests. You no, know, you're pre-approved for a certain amount, but a lot of agents want to bring you to houses that are way cheaper than that. It's, it's that inherent bias that's in there. Yes. Home ownership's part of it, but at the same time, we, we you know I would argue overall it's not black people. A lot of people are in homes just to say they got a home, but they're not they're not even living in it. They're killing themselves. Yes. They're murdering themselves to try to hold on to this dream. And the reality is your your own home technically is not an investment. It's your place where you live. Yes. Because you'd be crazy to take your own home, take a big mortgage against your house, and invest it in a business. Because if that business fails, you lose your house. Yes. You'd be nuts, right? You should buy another piece of real estate that's under a corporate name to leverage other things. So if that crashes, you and your family are still safe, right? Yeah. Um, I, I, I would say homeowners is part of the assets or real estate investments part of that. I would say overall as an asset allocation, how do we acquire assets, period? Whether it be real estate, whether it be stocks, whether it be shares, whether it be pensions, whether it be property, whether it be businesses. Overall, yeah. we got to start thinking about the overall picture. Right. Yes. Right. So, you know I mean, so for instance, you know, the stock market, you no, know, I talked to some friends about how do we really shake things up and change this move from beyond statements to really making a difference. Well, yeah. all these companies traded on the Toronto stock exchange have institutional investors, right? Okay. What yeah. if we took over one of those big institutions and say, we're going to own 5% of that big share buying company. So yes. one of the institutions, let's say we have a 5% say, then we say, okay, the next meeting for that company, we say, we want two people on the board. Right. Why? If you don't do it, I'm going to divest 5% of your stock. Stock price hmm. dropped by 5%. Other people, your stock price drop. If the stock price drop, you see how fast that board, go find a sister or brother to put on that board. Tomorrow, they find somebody. Right? Right. right. Because all about this. So, I'm talk- so power, home ownership is part of it, but also understand how the system cycles and actually works. That's, That's the big part of it. Yeah, yeah. And that makes, that makes a lot of sense, especially for... Um, I think of my, my Pilates instructor friends who are just like working for someone else. They don't own their home. They're in like New York city or they're in LA or something where like, or Vancouver, where you, you're not going to buy a house downtown anytime soon, but you can have assets. You can, you know, divest it, like put everything in one spot that gives you that leverage to have a voice to do those different things. So what would you say? Like, so then let's make this practical. Everything that you said, take that back and speak to the, the fitness person who is just trying to get on their feet financially, that black person, what kind of leverage can they have? What kind of steps can they take today that is going to put them in a position economically to have some power? The first thing is, for, I mean, as a small business owner, I could relate because I've been working for myself for six years directly, right? I don't yes. have a nine to five. Um, so, so, so I think the, the first thing is, 
whether you're renting all this stuff. I mean, I know people who rent to own five other properties that they own, right? Yeah, for, right. for investment purposes. So let's get out of the first thing is don't stay in those boxes that society puts in. Okay. Right. Yes. Do this, do that, do this, do that. You'll, you'll just be a nine to five. You'll be like everyone else. Mm -hmm. Right. And your unique value picture doesn't make any sense. The key thing is here as a black entrepreneur right now is you got to drive those value statements and look for niches out there that no one else is hitting and stick to it. Consistency. So it's almost like this Venn diagram, right? Because yeah. so it would be in a fitness community or whatever. Here's what people want yeah. or need. Here's what you offer, right? And how can you make money from it? It's the middle and that yeah. intersects. And, but the key is you got to actually know, believe in what you're doing. That's number one. Yes. If you're going to sit at three in the morning working on that proposal, it better be because you love it. Mm -hmm. Right. If you're not going to see your kid, your spouse for a week or right, you're too busy working, it better be because you love what you're doing. Number one, because a lot of times people start something for a trend or get involved in because of a trend or take some yeah. quick money. When you don't have the passion, it will catch up to you. Yes. Yeah. But then it feels like a nine to five again mm -hmm. for you. Number right. one. The number two is a black entrepreneur is, I think what works for me is having right partnerships. Yes. you got to seek alliances and partnerships that deliver the goods. Mm -hmm. that, that is the hardest part when you are black. A lot of people are looking at me like, oh, that sounds great and fine, buddy. When it comes down to money time, they split because yeah. black people are not associated with money, right? Or so with spending yeah. it, but not being the one on the other end of the table who yeah. receives it. Right. Um, so looking at the kind of right partnerships you're going to, and alliances you're going to use to build your practice or business is critical as a black person. Yeah. And one thing I have, I have to say was some black people aren't comfortable with this. You got to be dead honest with people. I am black and I know I don't have the same advantages you have. Here's what's happened to me, but here's what I'm trying to do. Right. Yeah. Point blank, lay out how racism or, or how being discriminated against has impacted you. Yes. I tell them, my company, Unify, I have three white business partners. I'm dead honest with them. Yeah. I'm like, you know what? The reason why I hesitated signing this partnership in the first place is because I've been screwed by a lot of people who look like you. Not because I was less talented, but when it came down to money, I got screwed. Yeah. Right? And yeah. just not by white. Other people of color have done it to me too from other right. communities. Mm -hmm. There's an article in the Star yesterday about some racism in the South Asian community towards black people that needs to be spoken about and talked yeah. about in business right. and in social circles and at school. And people don't want to talk about it, but too bad. I mean, real is real, right? Yeah. right. I, and I'm sorry, by the way, too, the black people seem to be allowed to talk a bit more now, finally, without getting punished, so we're going to talk, right? right. Yes. Um, so, so I think the key to for that, a black entrepreneur trying to figure out how to build that wealth is try to find niches, find partners who have a plan and a measured plan for that partnership. But you know what my grandmother always used to say, used to say never change, but always adopt. Mm -hmm. You got to keep changing. You got to keep adapting to what's going on and yeah. understand tech. No, yeah. understand how technology could change what you do. So the COVID has made people have to work out more from home. Can you create a business from that? Can you create a niche business from working from home? Do you know to take on the cost of owning a place? Right. right. So yeah. one thing I think black entrepreneurs do a lot too much. We spend too much money up front on things. Right. It should be reverse. Go get some revenue first. Yes. Win first. Win. win I think the first, first thing and this is a white person this is a white man who told me this and a white woman who are successful entrepreneurs told me years ago, your yes. best advertising plan is winning. Boom. You could have the crappiest website. Yes. You could have no, you can have the worst website, the worst IG page. But if you want a deal, word of mouth is better than anything else in the world. Go win. But again, as black people, because we, we see what's going on, we don't see enough. No, yeah. we'll spend 800 bucks on the website, 1,000 bucks on the website. We'll spend 3,000 bucks on Google ads. We'll buy all this equipment and you ain't won nothing yet. So when your credit card's filled up and you ain't won nothing yet. Yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah. we, you, you gotta go get the win. Go get a win. That, and a win that you could then say, I could let people know I won this and let them speak for you. Yes. Get a win. You got to win because that is how, you know, that's what gets people's attention, wins. We got to get real. And I understand anti-Black racism is fought on normal, numerous fronts. And I, I respect all the fronts. I support all the fronts in some way. The economic discussion is no joke. No. Right? 
That is yes. where, excuse my language, where shit hits the fan. Yes. Period. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And the and there's things there are social constructs behind that, but the reality is, you know, dollars talk, man. Right. Exactly. You know what I mean? And you know, the, you know, the Supreme Court of Canada, it's about two thousand and three. There was a case where someone got fired from them job and they had to, they took it to the Supreme Court and won. And the the judge said in his ruling, he ruled for the person who got fired. And the judge said, employment is very important, just not an economic, but employment is how you define yourself in social circles. It's how you yeah. define yourself in society. You know, yeah. When you meet people, what do you normally say? Hi, how are you? Oh, what do you do for a living? What do you do? Yes. Right? What do you do for a living? It's the next question. Right. And when you are unemployed or struggling financially, it makes it hard to be in social circles. Everyone talks about their job or their career. So maybe you don't go. And this is me talking personally. I've been there twice. Right. Where maybe I don't want to go up to a bar with my friends. I'm, I'm like, man, if I've got to spend 22 bucks tonight, uh, yeah, that's too much money. Right. Or maybe you don't want to sit, tell you, explain to your kid, okay, I can't take you out for ice cream because you make an excuse, but you're like, I don't want to spend the money because you're worried. No, right. maybe when people want to go to the go to a club that night, you, you don't want to go because subconsciously you're thinking about I don't have it, and what that does it affects you. How it impacts you mentally. Yeah. Um, now imagine when you're black, and that happens because it's already bad if you had a job, you still felt a little bit below the totem pole, and now look what happens to you, right? Yeah. So yeah. when the judge made that statement, and I was fighting the company in court on the same type of issue, no you amplify that when you're black. <laughs> yes. Right? And and as an entrepreneur, you know, sometimes, sometimes we're not treated, even an entrepreneur, like you don't have a real job because you're an entrepreneur. Go get a real job, right? Yes. yes. So, so those things have severe material impact. And, you know, so this fight for racial equality or economic equality has to be paramount in our discussion. Because when yeah. you, if a group of us have funds, we could shut down that grocery store chain that's not listening to us. We could cause we could cause a lot of pain for them. We all say for two weeks, nobody shop there. Yes. It's likewise, if we all had money and put stocks and bought shares in some of these companies, we could then say at the board meeting, why is Martin not on the board? Yes. Or why when the allocated that, well, I'm not gonna do it. Okay, to say goodbye to your stock price. Yeah. Right? And then you'll see it on BNN. Tomorrow, Bloomberg, this company's stock price dropped 14%. What happened? They're going to call you and be like, ah, it was me. Mm. You guys don't listen. You don't hear you must feel. Tech that and done. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. So you can march on the street and you can march in other ways. There's different ways. There's different ways. Everything has to work together. Yes. And the, the, the thing I'll say to that too is this equality discussion. I watched the Malcolm X quote last week. Um, cause you know what happened to Fonte Miller caused a lot of emotion for a lot of us. Yes. And you know, Malcolm X had a son that he said, they asked him, what do you mean? How do you define equality? And I loved what he said. He goes, first of all, the, the question is the wrong question. Equal to what? Right. And I stopped and I said, I pause. I'm like, damn, Malcolm, 60, yeah. 1962, you're talking like this. Mm -hmm. And I thought about it. It's true. Equal to what? Okay, I want equal income. I want equal position. I want equal that. But who's there? What is and who says what you define as the right standard in the first place? Yeah. Who said suit and tie has to be worn in the boardroom? But you're but yet you ripped off shareholders in two thousand eight by your fake loans. Right. Who said that you know you are the standard for how we do social justice when you can't even. You can't put an officer in jail for knocking out a black man's eye, right? right. Who says right. that you are the standard for X, no, for equality when Aboriginal, the first peoples are living in terrible conditions? So equal right. to what? To your standard? Hmm. And when he said, he, he was talking about it in his context, but I thought about it in our context. It's yeah, insane. equality to what? Hmm. Equal to what and to whom? It still implies that you're superior to me. Right. Mm -hmm. You, okay, it calls for you to be like me. Actually, I don't know if being like you is actually what the, what the goal is. The, yeah. goal is to say everyone, the goal is to be everyone could be who they are, and then equally and fairness is applied. But you tell me yes. the fight to be like you, but I need 15 degrees to, go, to be like you? Hmm. And i and I got to suffer 10 years, 15 years of our lifetime of making $10,000, $15,000 less a year than you did? 
So yeah. how can I make those investments that I need to make to secure my future, my kid's future, if I'm making 20 grand less a year than you every year, simply because of the color of my skin? Yeah. Right? So no I think... Yeah. So I think so. I think in one element that equal discussion, and I'll, I'll, I think a key thing for us too as well. We live in North America. And I know COVID's going on right now. No, North America's small. There's a whole world you can do business in. So you yeah. know, I do. I do business in Southeast Asia quite a bit. Yeah. No, the world's a big place. Don't sit down here and think it's the only place where you can go make your money. No, right. I go to Southeast Asia, and they tell me, you got, you know, Barack or President Obama grew up in Indonesia. Mm-hmm. And they love them over there. And they told some business people told me over there that more black people should be trying to do business here. Can we actually the image of President Obama really made us look at black people as more than just athletes? There you go. And I had to see CEOs of two major banks tell me this. And they call me Mr. Rad. They have cars waiting for me when they pick me up. I'm treated like my title, like a chief innovation officer. Here, I'm often treated like the sales rep coming in to harass you or some black guy coming in trying to sell you something. Over there, I'm treated, where I'm treated with my, according to my job title. Right. right? I'm not saying right. everywhere's perfect. I'm just saying that the world's a big place and it's lots of opportunity globally to do what you do. Yes. yes. Within the internet, et cetera. So I also would say think globally because everywhere you go in the world is a KFC. Everywhere you go, there's a McDonald's. Yeah. <laughs> Everywhere you go, there's a Pizza Hut. So why can't you be in a couple of places on the planet? Right. Why can't you do it too? Right. right. I believe the number is 45% of Fortune 500 pro- revenues come from outside of North America. Those are the questions I want us to really ask ourselves. It's like equal to what? And you said it once and it, it, we flew past it, but black wealth matters. It's yeah, such a key, that's such a good line, man. Like we could take another that's hour on hashtag. that one. Yeah. That's my hashtag on everything now. Black wealth matters. Um, yeah. And there's some resources. Is um, some people on here have good websites that are posting economic stats. I'll link them to you, Martin. Yes, on economic do. stats. Yeah, yeah, black wealth matters, man. Straight up. You know yeah. what? Black lives matter. Black wealth matters. And again, it doesn't mean doesn't mean that no one else matters. To be clear, yeah. again, it yeah. just means that enough. And this is 400 years. And we are walking around with the last things of our owners. Yeah. We're going to very, how many people in the world can say you're walking around with the last thing of the people who owned you? Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. So don't right. so so it is time for us to get real about what's going on out here today. And yes. no I don't have all the answers, you don't have all the answers, but let's continue the dialogue, let's learn yes. from each other, and let's push for economic and financial improvement because that was sort of a nice foundation, not just for us, but for our kids as well. Beautiful. And tomorrow, Damon's on talking about education. So we'll tie in this conversation and just build off of that and continue the conversation tomorrow. I'll be well, listening, man. bro. Awesome. Thank I'll you so much, listening. Brad, man. It's so good today. Thank you to everyone who is tuned in and for your input. You'll see the replay on IG, core conversations on Facebook. It'll be like condensed there and let's keep the conversation going. Brad, just put your comments in there as well and, and we'll keep uh, sparking this conversation. Good stuff. Thanks so much, man. I'll sign you off right now. All right, guys. Peace out, man. Thank you so much for joining us today on Core Conversations. This organic platform has been made possible by amazing people like yourself. So if you're a Pilates instructor or a movement specialist of some kind and you want to be a guest, please message me. If you're in some other field and, you know, the messages just resonate with you, message me. I'd love to have you on. All of our messages connect and for some reason they all help us in this battle. We're all in this game together, so I'd love to hear from you. Let your words be life to someone else. Check out our website, personalvictory.ca. Click the Core Conversations page to see who our upcoming guests are, and I will see you next time on Core Conversations.